Evening. My name is Ted Landsmark. I am director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern University. Uh, you've tuned into uh, uh, our open classroom session tonight, which will be uh, discussing uh, matters of social justice and climate. And uh, as um, luck would have it or irony would have it, uh, we have a panel this evening uh, that is located in various parts of the world where in one location it's snowing um, and in another uh, Midwestern location, as far as I know, it's not snowing. And uh, in our most Western location, that is to say Hawaii, I am certain it is not snowing. <laughs> uh, we... Uh, are recording this session as we do each week. Um, and I remind folks that uh, next week is uh, school vacation week um, at Northeastern. So we will not be here, but we will be back in two weeks. Um, and uh, at the end of uh, today's session, we'll fill you in on the details of uh, what we'll be discussing uh, two weeks from now. Um, my collaborator uh, for the open classroom this semester uh, is Rebecca Riccio, and I am happy to turn the screen over to her uh, to begin a conversation about uh, climate and social justice. Rebecca, you're on. Thank you so much, Ted, and welcome to everybody in our audience and all our panelists. And as always, Hammy and Kwai are tech specialists who keep us on the air and engaging with everybody. As those of you who have been here for the last few weeks know, we are using our newly released principles of anti-oppressive community engagement for university researchers and faculty as an organizing principle for the open classroom this semester. And the principles acknowledge that the power and resource imbalance between universities and the communities in which they work can lead to relationships characterized by exploitation, uh, they can be extractive and they can result in unintended harms. But we also know that the resources and knowledge that universities have can be really constructive and powerful tools. And like any tools, it's really a question of the values and practices that you employ while using them to ensure that you're doing good and not harm. And so we're really excited tonight to have some folks with us who are thinking about these issues really deeply and are envisioning what it means to use our expertise, our resources, our tools to engage communities in the decision-making that will affect their lives, in particularly uh, in our case tonight, in relation to climate and social justice. So I am absolutely delighted to introduce our colleague Moira Zellner, who will go ahead and introduce herself and the panelists tonight as we learn what this thing is called participatory modeling and collaborative decision making. And I'll, I'll say Moira, last week as we were ending the class, uh, we committed to making sure that we don't get caught up in our own cool jargon, uh, which is another form of being exclusive. Yes. And so we'll, I'm looking forward to a conversation in which we're holding ourselves accountable for that uh, and, and making this accessible to everybody, which I know is the point of the work that this team is doing. So thank you and I will hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Ted for, for having us. I'm, I'm excited to be here sharing a panel with uh, colleagues from various institutions uh, uh, um, across the United States who have been involved in developing and, and supporting participatory modeling approaches to make people visible and vocal. Uh, this panel is about how we try to establish the practice of participatory modeling to make this happen and the different ingredients that are necessary in, in this process. So what I'll do is I'll introduce each one of my colleagues as we take turns presenting these different uh, ingredients. Um, but in general, the outline is I'm going to start by explaining a little bit what is participatory modeling, and then I'll pass it on to uh, the, my, the, the others in the panel who are going to talk about these different ingredients, and then I'll wrap up uh, with kind of like the future of the field. Um, so I am a professor uh, in, in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at, at Northeastern. I'm also the director of participatory modeling and data science in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities. 
Um, so this is like very dear and dear to my to to my heart. And so um, the, the the we apply um, uh, this kind of approach to the kinds of problems that are just hard to solve. We call them socio-ecological because they combine the human and the natural side of, 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 of systems. Um, and, and these kinds of problems like climate change, they are complex and wicked. You might have heard that uh, you know, term before, but, and if not, I'll just explain it. It's essentially, it's these kinds of problems that cannot be easily characterized and addressed. And there was early talk in the 1970s about the definition of these kinds of problems and how we fail to address them properly, but not because we're necessarily incompetent as planners, for example, or as policymakers, but because the characteristics of the problem themselves being so uh, open-ended where you have multiple actors and factors that create these problems is what makes them hard to deal with. Um, and so there has been some work in the field of the study of complex systems uh, that gives a framework and a set of tools to understand these, these problems so that they're not so frustrating and obscure to deal with. So, they help us identify more clearly the aspects of, of these problems that make them wicked. But also more importantly, what are the mechanisms by which they are or become wicked problems so that then we can measure and bound the uncertainty that is often tied to these kinds of problems and see where we can uh, point to intervention points uh, that might help us choose a desirable pathway as, as a collective system into the future. So things like, you know, these selective interactions that happen at the local level, but that give rise to this higher level kind of complication, like, you know, how driving behavior might lead to traffic jams, for example, or the fact that there are different kinds of feedback in the system that might create self-organization and coherence and collective action, but can also amplify some effects and just lead us to, to more problems like you know, climate change being a, a, a specific uh, example of that. Um, and then like the uncertainty that is, that is tied to that. So here's just like you know, thinking of pathways that can bifurcate. We have choices and depending on where we have interventions, it can shift that pathway into you know, one or the other. And some may be more desirable than, than others. So the problem that we have is that typically if we try to apply some of these tools, these modeling tools, what happens is that they tend to, to occur, like you know, modeling happens with scientists and separate from the policy making and decision making world. Um, and, and so that doesn't give really much opportunity for learning and innovation and adaptation from these two worlds uh, combining where we can, as, as decision makers or as stakeholders, can inspect what models do and why do they work the way they do? What are the assumptions? And why are those assumptions valid? What about other assumptions, right? Um, and the scientists don't have the opportunity also to incorporate all of that kind of discussion. And so there, there isn't much conversation or, or great conversation between these two realms. So instead, what we advocate for in this panel and other colleagues that work with us is to integrate different forms of, of, of knowledge by integrating policy making, decision making, and modeling so that we can make these different forms of knowledge more visible to all of us, allowing then for an ongoing discussion of both the physical system, but also our values, our shared and maybe not shared values, and then around these things, then co-design solutions. And this is you know, a setup of ongoing uh, learning process. So what is participatory modeling? Is this purposeful learning so it's this engaged process, collaborative process of coming together towards decision-making, but that requires some learning together uh, that engages this, these different kinds of knowledge, not just multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral, but also implicit and explicit. They're tacit things, like things that we know, but we don't even are aware that, that we know them. And in this way, create together these shared representations that allow us to then work and have these conversations and uh, uh, towards, um, towards solutions, like to better understand the problem and then solutions. And this came out of 
uh, some workshops, this, this panel in particular came together in, in uh, a, a great part of this panel, came together in these workshops that were supported by the SYSINC Center in, in, in Maryland, uh, I think between 2016 and 18, where we tried to coalesce the field of participatory modeling, uh, uh, you know, coming to, to, together with coordinated uh, publications and consolidation of the knowledge in the field, but, you know, how to uh, bring it together. And so essentially there are different kinds of modeling approaches that exist for different kinds of uh, purposes. And so we've got, you know, we need to go through problem identification and they're mostly qualitative approaches that may be applied to that. There's also like, we need to, once we identify a problem, we need to understand it a little bit better. So there we may use some kind of like approaches that may be quantitative, but not necessarily very uh, computationally intensive. Uh, and then there are more like quantitative approaches that help us analyze a problem and start running scenarios about what the future uh, would look like. Um, so depending on the stage of, of a process, the kind of problem, the driving question that you have, the context of the problem, like the amount and kinds of data that may be available, the modalities in which knowledge is shared, uh, the skills required versus the budget and the time that we have, we might choose a different set of tools uh, to, to do this work with communities. And so speaking to that, Renee Wallace uh, is the CEO and founder of Doer's Edge. She's definitely a doer. Uh, she's a fantastic collaborator focusing on engagement. Um, and, and we had like from the very beginning, back in 2015, when we met each other, we really like clicked on this aspect of like thinking of, yes, it's modeling, but it's a very human uh, activity. So with that, Renee, I, I'll, I'll go on to, to you. Yeah, thank you for that. And I was glad, I'm happy to be here with everyone this evening. And so I come to this uh, conversation as uh, from the perspective of community. I'm a, a business leader, I'm also a community leader and I uh, do systems process and change work. Uh, so when I look at this and we talk about engagement, particularly in a participatory uh, process, uh, one of the first things I look at is who's the initiator? Where does the engagement actually initiate from? And from my experience thus far in, in working on participatory modeling projects, I see three points of, of ways in which engagement really starts, and it really determines how participatory it actually can be. Um, if, if I meet, uh, say, Maura talked about us meeting back in 2016, and we meet and we find that we have uh, some complementary drivers behind our, our interest in a particular topic, I have interest in it from a community standpoint. She has interest as a researcher. We would come together and work on that. And our interest levels are probably gonna be pretty even at that point. So we're gonna treat each other as collaborators and our engagement is gonna look, is gonna be framed by that perspective that we come together. Um, the other alternatives are if, if it's a research body of work, it's something that you want to explore as an academic. And it's really about how you contribute to the body of research that exists that helps us make change. You're gonna to come to that differently. You're gonna drive that mainly from a research perspective, engaging students and your, your involvement of community and, and uh, representatives and leaders is gonna look a little different. And when I talk to people in the community, oftentimes they describe it as being uh, in a laboratory and, and actually being research subjects as opposed to, you know, the, the, the alternative, which was collaborative that I described a moment ago. Um, and, and the opposite is also true. Uh, uh, as community leaders, we're focused on the issue, what's happening right here where I am and driving that I'm gonna have stronger interest. I want more people engaged who are involved, you know, from the community. And, and I look, you know, you may look at the researchers and students and really actually treat them more as resources. I need you to come help do this. Um, that, that, those three ways, even where we start, has a lot to do with what it really looks like uh, from a participatory standpoint. So, you know, Maura talked about earlier about making voices visible and, 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 and uh, 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 being engaged in analysis and decision-making where we start has a lot to do with that and how our perspective uh, is shaped. Next slide, please. 
Another thing that I found um, is, is, is important to this too is the roles. Uh, when we look at projects, participatory modeling projects, there's a whole variety of roles. And, and I happen to have a strong uh, uh, view that it, it should look complementary. Um, so just as we have PIs who lead from an academic side on all projects, you require PIs and you've got researchers and students who are doing things, you have evaluators and other roles, most times the projects are pretty heavy on the academic representative side relative to uh, how teams are constructed. Um, if we're looking at this work and we really are holding the community voice uh, who's having the lived experience being impacted by this work, for this to be even more valuable, more impactful, more effective, I believe we balance the team on the roles. You have a community PI, you have an academic PI, you've got researchers, you've got community-based engaged researchers. There may be some skill development that has to go along with that to fill those roles, but that's part of the process. Students are learning, community members can learn as well. I happen to be playing a process monitor role on a project in Flint, and that role has not been on any of the teams in the, before, but I happen to come to it with a lot of experience in doing that as a profession. So being able to carry out these roles and give that learning opportunity both uh, as decision makers, as well as people who are engaged you know, in the research. So building that team. The next piece is looking at, next slide please, is as we look at all of the phases in the modeling project, then we wanna make sure that we maintain that engagement throughout all phases. A lot of times you see a lot more participation in the data collection, but really in the very beginning in accurately defining the problem, you really need deep engagement with the community because it's the lived experience. It's what's actually happening on the ground, setting the project goals. What are we really trying to accomplish with this? So yes, we want research, but we want research that can be applied and it's gonna actually solve a problem and bringing your perspective to that's important. Who we involve in the process and engage. How do we get engaged in even the data collection? Um, uh, and, and gathering the information, the skills that get built, you know. So while we're doing this work, building in that learning process also and making room for that learning is really, really important throughout every single phase. And, and it may vary uh, in terms of what, how much people can participate in each phase, but there should be a level of participation intentionally and deliberately designed, you know, in the project for that. This next piece describes how we get there. Uh, when we look at the continuum of engagement, we're all familiar with that. So anywhere from starting to, you're engaged from an outreach standpoint, all the way to shared leadership. A lot of times when I'm sitting in rooms, I hear people say, oh, people are so busy. They really don't have time uh, to do all of this. And my, my contention is put the opportunities on the table and let each person weigh in on what level they want to be engaged. They want to see change. They want to see forward progress in, in what's happening. So that's important on both sides, on the academic side, as well as the um, community side. You may, it may be factors uh, around your workload at a particular point in time. Do you have the capacity? Do you have the interest? Do you have the skills to learn? So we want to take a look at and intentionally ask people about their engagement. Next slide. And what I've used and developed in my work is what I call a pathway to participation. So we look at all the research opportunities. We ask people what levels they want to be engaged in and they create what I call their 100. They tell us specifically based upon where they are at a point in time, their interest on this project, exactly what their pathway uh, to participation would look like. And that is extremely you know, important, I think, in, in how participatory uh, modeling projects actually are. And I'm gonna hand it back to uh, Maura. Thank you, Renee. So from uh, engagement, we've got to assess how these processes work. And this is where Dan uh, Mills uh, in, in Hawaii uh, is uh, really uh, influential. Uh, so he's in both the Department of Urban and Regional Planning and the Matsunaga Institute for uh, for peace, 
I thought it was peace and conflict resolution. Did I miss a part of your title there? We shorten it sometimes. That's fine. okay. <laughs> okay, but he's done amazing work building on the learning sciences and planning to assess participatory modeling processes and learn how to facilitate them effectively. So with that, I'll uh, go on to you. Great, thank you, Moira, uh, and thanks, Ted and Rebecca, for having us. I'm really happy to be here to talk about this. Uh, I also want to point out that I owe a huge, uh, a huge debt to uh, another presenter today, Layla Lyons. Uh, and uh, and our, our mutual colleague Josh Radinsky, um, back from uh, the UIC days, who helped develop these methods. Um, part of this starts from the question of like, you know, how do we understand or how do we know that the participatory modeling process or any participatory process has actually gotten us the results that we're after? Uh, so we might, you know, do take take the the great advice from uh, um, you know from Renee and design these processes. Uh, and, and, and implemented them, but then how do we know that they've actually been successful? So we, we've contrasted this with the traditional approach because when we started this work, uh, it seems like last century, uh, but a while ago, we, we, we started from the standpoint of how typical participatory processes are run and how they're typically evaluated. And they're inherently based on power asymmetries. I mean, even going back to Sherry Arnstein's initial work on power dynamics and participatory planning way back in the 1960s, they're based on a power imbalance between the folks that have it, typically the government and the folks that do not. And so when we design processes from that standpoint, all of the, the learning, uh, all of the exchange is really focused on, uh, and has been focused on uh, information acquisition uh, rather than on mutual learning. And so that leads to you know, what, what could be called didactic collaboration. That is, there's a, an ulterior mode Motive. That is, the folks that have the power are designing these processes for a particular purpose, for a particular reason, to achieve a particular objective that may or may not be in line with what the community needs, what the community wants, what the community likes, uh, and so on. And that, that sort of sets up uh, processes that end up being and end up becoming very and can be very patronizing in, in their atmosphere, in their tone, in their setup, in their design. In these circumstances, the evaluation is often based on uh, very narrow things. It's often based uh, very narrowly on the retention of information. So do people actually know uh, what we've expected them to know or, or have we actually gathered the information? Do we remember the information that the public has given us? And then participation is very narrowly defined as, as attendance. Are people showing up? Are there large numbers of people sitting in the seats at the meetings that we've designed? And the tools that we typically use in these circumstances are the, are, you know, the usual suspects. We do a lot of survey work. Dot voting is often a go-to. Uh, very rarely on occasion, they'll do, we'll do focus groups uh, and also more intensive interviews. Um, but it typically sort of ends up being survey based and and the meetings that then we design that, that, that come out of this model end up looking very much like this. They, this should be very familiar to all of us so we can see the, the presenter here at the front of the room who's sharing information with the public that is seated in this uh, in this you know stadium arrangement of seating and and on the either side on the dais or at these fancy tables with tablecloths and, and name placards are the experts, the, the, the empowered, the local elite, right? The people who make the decisions. And so you set up this very um, imbalanced information exchange where you have folks who have power to do something and folks who don't who are trying to extract information or share information. Next slide, please. Thank you. We found that this doesn't work when it comes to uh, building the kind of learning, learning environments around collaborative modeling that we need. And, and so we've shifted our approach from evaluating it from this perspective of information acquisition to focusing it on, on, on processing information. So how are folks actually understanding the complexities of the problems that they're facing? We also thought more about learning as this distributive or distributed uh, uh, activity where, where it's not just one person giving and one person receiving, it's about folks doing stuff together uh, around a con common uh, problem space and around a common set of tools. The other thing to point out that we've, we focused on is, is that we focused on this uh, this, this practicality. It's about the actions. It's about the things that people are doing as they're sitting around the table. And it's not about some rational calculus. It's not about whether or not the group came up with the perfect best right answer. So all of this uh, jives with what we're learning about how to do better community engagement, but also jives with what we know about complex systems and how complex systems actually function and what we need to know about them. This approach blends together a couple of different um, uh, worldviews on learning. One coming from the, the work on, on communities of practice and the other coming from the work on, on what's known as situated learning. 
an evaluation focuses a little bit more broadly on, on things like participant interactions, like what are people doing when they're sitting at the table and working through these problems? And it also focuses on not just what people know, but also on the judgments that they're making about complex problems. How are they considering the trade-offs that are necessary given the challenges that they might face related to problems like flooding or climate change, right? So it's not just about what people know, the information, it's about how they make sense of these things as well. And where we've really kind of moved the ball forward is on the, the, the tools that we're using. Uh, so one of the, one, I like to break these down in terms of the diagnostic tools that we use, the formative tools. Uh, so we're assessing uh, learning as a, as a formative process, but also learning then as a, as a summative process. So learning at the end of this. So the diagnostic tools we, we typically refer to or use are like intake surveys, where we're asking folks to tell us what their concerns are. And, and Layla has done a lot of great work in, in moving, moving us forward and helping, helping us identify what folks are concerned with in terms of their individual profiles of, of, of risk and, and, and their own assessment of different solutions to particular problems uh, when we're talking about, say, uh, environmental issues. We've also looked at using and have used tools like, uh, I like to call them exit ticket surveys. So after folks leave a meeting, we ask them to, to talk about the things that they experienced and what they did. We're working on tools that uh, track what users are doing using uh, online tools, but also what they're doing in, uh, in terms of tabletop exercises, how folks are actually manipulating the models that we're working with. And one of the ones that I've spent a lot of time working on is what I refer to as participatory interaction analysis, which is where we're taking video recordings of, of meetings, video recordings of groups working together and breaking them down line by line, turn by turn, uh, utterance by utterance to see how folks are making judgments uh, as they're working with the tools to understand the flow of decisions, the flow of considerations, and, and how those learning processes play out as, as folks interact. And then at the end of the process, to figure out how folks have, have you know, gathered this information, what kinds of conclusions they've drawn, we'll do surveys and interviews and focus groups, those standard set of tools, to help us really uh, bookend all of the, the the information that we've gathered from folks to really truly understand what it is that they've learned, how they've actually developed or improved the judgments that they make about complex systems, and how they're actually going to apply these things to improve the, the community that, that they live in. Thank you. Oops. Sorry. That's, That's okay. Thank you, uh, Dan. Uh, so we're going to Miles now to think of uh, he's a director for community engaged research at Michigan State University. And to think now about the role uh, 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 of training and education, uh, Miles have been a rock convening uh, conferences and field schools that, and making things happen to establish this community of practice and scale up training. That's right. I get to do all the inglorious work in the background um, while the modelers get the glory. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my pathway into the participatory modeling space. And I'm gonna talk about the institutional environment at, at my university that supports some of this work and, and the kind of training that we help support. So uh, my office is the University Outreach and Engagement. Well, what does the University Outreach and Engagement Office do? Our, ours does really three things. It supports faculty, staff, and student engagement with communities in, in five different forms community-engaged research, and of course, participatory modeling falls within that, within that realm, but also community-engaged creative, creative activities, teaching and learning, often referred to as service learning, service and practice, and even commercialized activities that are community-engaged. And our office also serves as a, as a portal for public access to university expertise and resources, Although we understand that expertise and resources don't just exist within the walls of universities, there's plenty of expertise and resources out there in the world. And we also um, advocate for different forms of exemplary engaged scholarship, both at our institution and, and nationally. Next slide, please. Um, so, how did we develop and support a training model for participatory modeling? Well, it was, it was a long pathway and it took some time. Back in 2014, a group of us with shared interests in understanding and tackling complex problems in partnership with communities, using a systems approach started meeting and talking. And I came into this space uh, really from, from two perspectives. One, as an engagement professional working in an engagement office, and, and, 
and especially being interested in collaborative and participatory approaches to inquiry. And what I loved about, about participatory modeling uh, was that the systems approach offered what to me looked like a more effective approach to social problem solving. Because I had at that point almost 20 years of, of practice as a program evaluator and, and witnessing, to be frank, some pretty ineffective linear approaches to social problem solving. And it seemed to me that systems approaches offered something else. So as someone whose responsibility is to support and celebrate engaged approaches to uh, social inquiry, participatory modeling was something that I clearly wanted to get involved with and support. So those of us who were meeting in, in 2014 hatched the idea of um, creating a conference and inviting others with similar interests in collaborative modeling to join us. So we held our first conference in 2015 uh, and it featured uh, tracks for both uh, people who wanted to become expert modelers, but also community members who wanted to learn about it and see how it might be used uh, as, as a form of, of, as an effective tool for problem solving for them. And at that time, we thought about collaborative modeling in two senses. One was interdisciplinary, and the other was with communities. And sometimes those things were combined, right? Because complex problems don't respect disciplinary boundaries. And the book you see on the right there was an outgrowth of that first conference. We held a second one in 2016. And then in 2018, several of us uh, from the MSU conference planning team attended a session on participatory modeling at the International Environmental Modeling and Software Society conference in Fort Collins, Colorado. And that's where the online participatory modeling community of practice was born. If you're not familiar with that, um, it's at uh, participatorymodeling.org. So you can go check that out. And it was after that conference and also after the succinct meeting that Moira referred to, that we decided instead of holding another big conference, we wanted to be more focused on participatory modeling and we wanted to make it an intense experience and we wanted to connect it to community. And, and that was the 2019 um, Participatory Modeling Field School in Detroit on the campus of Wayne State University that featured a field trip to go out and engage with um, Detroit community leaders and to learn about what kinds of issues communities were struggling with. And Renee Wallace was absolutely instrumental in making all of that happen. Uh, because of the pandemic, unfortunately, in 2021, we had to go virtual, which is not great for a field school. I mean, there's no field, right? Um, but in 2022, in August, we're back in Detroit, we are delighted to be back in Detroit. And this time we're explicitly designing the field school to feature modeling with community leaders throughout the field school and before. Next slide. So here you see the um, essentially the rough schedule for our 2022 field school. And now I'm not just advertising it, it's, it's here so I can explain the, the thinking behind the training. Um, <clears throat> so if, if we're going to um, model with community leaders in the field school, a lot of work needs to happen before the field school um, to make that a reality. And Renee is going to be centrally involved in that. So in March through June of this year, um, she's going to be uh, engaging with Detroit community leaders and with the modelers, the modeling instructors, to think about, um, to surface particular issues, to identify which modeling techniques are appropriate for them, to develop problem statements, to gather any available data that might be relevant to the modeling process and to orient folks to the field school. Now, if you look at the first two days of the field school, Monday and Tuesday, there's no instruction in modeling techniques. Well, why? I mean, if I pay my money and I show up to a participatory modeling field school, I want to learn about agent-based modeling. Well, 
The reason is that there's a lot more that goes into a participatory modeling project than the modeling itself. So we start off with a general introduction to systems thinking. How do you use systems thinking to frame complex problems and try to understand them? Then we go out for that entire afternoon on Monday on a driving tour to meet with community leaders and to understand their perspectives and concerns and to um, connect those then to the modeling that happens in the field school. On Tuesday, we start out the morning by talking about how you identify and formulate problems for modeling. Second, how do you design a modeling team and a project that's grounded in equitable participation? Third, how do you select the right modeling technique for the problem? And fourth, how do you engage community members throughout the modeling process? Only after we've completed all that can we even talk about the modeling techniques. So then on Wednesday, we have two three-hour blocks where participants dive in and they get to pick one of four modeling techniques, agent-based modeling, fuzzy cognitive mapping, system dynamics modeling, and social network analysis. And then we wrap the day up um, with a focus on what Dan was just talking about, which is, well, how do you evaluate um, this thing? Uh, Thursday morning, we start with a panel on um, some perspectives on what are the new directions that the disciplinary modeling is taking. And then folks um, attend another two, three hour blocks of modeling instruction, this time on a second technique. And then we wrap it up with a session that really integrates all of that. Thinking about the overall design of the project, and if you look at the schedule, those are all of the elements, right? Of, of how you put this together. From surfacing problems, engaging communities, identifying modeling techniques, and then actually doing the modeling. Um, and at, in that last session, um, our participants will talk about what progress they've made in, uh, in modeling particular issues with community members. Thank you so much, Miles. Uh, and rapidly going to our last, but definitely not least speaker, um, Leila Lyons, uh, currently a program officer and the director for, for Directorate for Education and Human Resources at the National Science Foundation. Leila has been a pioneer in my view and, and many other people's views. Uh, in terms of uh, computer-enabled uh, uh, systems that support learning uh, with applications in museums and also like the work that she's been has done with us in terms of you know uh, uh, situating this in planning context developing user interfaces to support collaborative learning um, and uh, just transforming the funding landscape as we speak thank you Maura yeah I'm not here to talk about my stuff I'm talking I'm here to talk about NSF stuff um, so, uh, as more mentioned, I'm currently at the uh, NSF in the Department of um, uh, EHR, so that would be Education and Human Resources. And what our mission is, is to develop a diverse and well-prepared U.S. STEM workforce and STEM literate public by supporting excellent research and development in STEM education. And that comes along a number of different strands uh, from examining how we can um, improve learning environments to how we can broaden participation uh, to how we can engage in workforce participation. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that's always important to keep in mind is that the structure of funding really does shape the structure of research, whether we like it or not. And this is the structure of funding at EHR. And you can see we have a whole bunch of different programs and some of these you might be familiar with and some of them you might not. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about today was how um, within NSF, uh, there's really been a, a sea change in the way that we are thinking about how we should conduct research. And I want to thank Renee uh, earlier for introducing the idea of a continuum of participation, because that's exactly what NSF has done. You know, it started off thinking that, well, you know, the non-researchers engaged in research, well, but first they're subjects. Well, no, that's not quite right. Well, maybe we'll think about them as participants. And in recent years, we've really been making an effort to regard people as partners or even sometimes leaders in research activities. And there's a really strong interest in engaging communities in an authentic and useful way in research activities. So, you know, we don't have people um, white knighting their way into communities, um, planning, you know, claiming that they're going to solve all the ills. Uh, we want to see um, all kinds of things that Renee was talking about, where communities are, are coming forward with their own issues and their own um, problems that they want researchers to target. And um, 
I want to talk about a couple of these projects. So there, there are a number of them highlighted in orange uh, that you might want to consider seeking funding for. Some of these I am a program officer for, and some of them I am not. Uh, so, for example, the uh, Smart and Connected Communities, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Uh, racial equity in STEM education. That's a new program. Uh, advancing informal STEM learning, where informal just means anything that's not a uh, formal classroom or workplace training situation. And then the includes program. Um, but as I said, I want to talk a little bit more about Smart and Connected. Uh, that's close to my heart, if you can skip to the next slide. All right, so uh, Smart and Connected Communities is a cross directorate program that encourages researchers to work with community stakeholders to identify and define challenges and then to have those challenges motivate use inspired research questions using smart technologies. Uh, the goal of the solicitation is to accelerate the creation of the scientific and engineering foundations that will improve the social, economic and environmental well being of those who live, work, learn or travel within a community. Projects must address both the technological and the social science components of smart and connected communities. Uh, the Smart and Connected solicitation uh, supports two different kinds of research projects, integrative research grants, which are up to four years and $2.5 million, and planning grants, which are just a year long and 150 k uh, which are intended to start building an idea and a team. So the, the program itself recognizes that there isn't always a natural connection and communication between communities and researchers, and that planning grant is intended to found that. So um, there are a couple of ways that you can get involved. Uh, one is, if you have an idea, come to us. Uh, come to us for funding. Uh, if you're not sure, feel free to email myself or another program officer. Um, give us a one pager of your idea. We'd be happy to meet with you and talk you through it and figure out how best to pitch it for the Spartan Connected program. Um, another really important way to get involved, though, is to volunteer to review. So some of this sea change that I've been talking about didn't come internally. It came from our review panels telling us Hey, I, you know, I like this grant. It's got a lot of intellectual merit, but you know, they they're assuming all kinds of things about the community participation that just seem wildly inappropriate. They're not paying them, they're not consulting them, and you know, it just doesn't seem right. Are we really going to fund projects that do that? And NSF thought about it and said, no, <laughs> we don't want to do fund projects that do that kind of thing. Um, and so if you can volunteer to be a reviewer, you can help help us shape the funding landscape. You have power here. It's not just a top-down thing. It's very much a bottom-up process. Um, so again, if you're interested in doing that, contact me or another program officer, and we would be thrilled uh, to find a way to slot you into the review process. It's a lot easier. Well, we'll see what happens when COVID restrictions stop, but right now all of our review panels are virtual, and we've had some really long discussions about how that really opens things up to reviewers who might not be able to take time away from their home for a few days to come to a review panel. So um, it's a really great time to get involved. Um, and then the third way you can get involved is uh, you can do what I did. I uh, was researching for a long time. And then I said, you know what? I think I'd like to um, try to do this from a bigger picture perspective. We are always hiring new program directors. Um, there are a lot of positions that are rotating positions where you're only here for a year to three years. And it gives you a really nice chance to you know, put your stamp on things, have your voice be heard. Uh, right now, for example, I'm in the thick of rewriting a solicitation where I'm able to interject things like, oh, we should really think about asking for this or requiring this from the people who are applying to the grants. And so, you know, these are all different ways where, you know, we can kind of shift the structure of this funding landscape to support more community minded things and, and really let those ideas percolate up instead of come from a top down fashion. So thank you. Thank you so much. And so I'm going to just wrap it up very quickly because I really want to give uh, room for um, uh, people to, you know, ask questions and to have more of a conversation. But just maybe like just references, like very like skimming over things like we have, uh, you know, put together some of these lessons learned from this activity throughout the many years. Uh, that that we've worked in this in this field in terms of like the skills that are required that are not like for people who want to come into this space. It's not just about learning how to model. In fact, as Dan was saying, it's just like one component only, but there's also these other aspects that are so important and have to do with like the way that we relate to others. Uh, like, and especially local experts, uh, being aware, being mindful, being able to translate across different uh, you know, realms of knowledge, making sure that whatever we do is culturally appropriate. Um, so in, in terms of like, you know, not everybody shares or creates knowledge in the same way, uh, like it's how important it is to really connect with community uh, 
colleagues uh, and understanding things like, you know, socially the power dynamics. And so that it's really about also managing participation, not so much just like, or just the model building. So knowing when to use this approach, maybe sometimes it's not really useful. Uh, and this uh, cultivating this inclusiveness and creativity for collaborative exploration and, and learning in a maybe in a playful uh, manner uh, and keeping things simple in, in a way as well. Uh, so all of this, you know, just building our collective capacity to innovate and address then uh, these complex uh, problems. Um, and then where are we going with this? There's, there's a lot of work that is going on that we, and areas of work that we've identified in terms of, again, like assessment is an area that Dan showed a little bit, but there's so much still yet to do. He's working on it. Other people are trying to work on this as well in terms of how do we measure some of the things that are happening in these processes that can help us understand then how, how well are we doing in this and how do we need to adapt our processes, our tools uh, in order to make it even better? How do we get into like that, that that uh, transition that happens when people uh, translate their mental models into these externalized shared representations in order to like really cause changes in the way that we do and think about things. Uh, how do we address barriers to interpretation and, and, and communication that exist because they're inevitable? Uh, and especially in the translation, like how do we go from this learning process into action, into communication, into access? How do we lower the barriers uh, for people to be part of, of this collaborative effort? How do we essentially scale up participation? Facilitation is a key activity here, and there's so much yet to learn about what needs to happen in that facilitate, facilitated process and what are some tools that can support that activity uh, as we acknowledge also, not just again like the modeling, but there are people who have different beliefs, they have different biases. How do we make all of that visible and something to work with uh, to be able to harness them, the power of the public to come up with new ways of understanding and new ways of doing things? So this whole idea of scaling up, not just the, 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 the results and the impact of what comes out of some of these processes, but also the process itself in terms of how do we engage more and more participants in this? Because you know a lot of our experience has been in in-person workshops in kind of like small settings, because if you have a lot of people together, it can get very unwieldy, but you know, are there ways to scale this up? What's the role of artificial intelligence in facilitating that? Uh, and as well as, how do we scale up the models? A lot of what we do maybe is in a, in, in a small area, but like, you know, our problems are large if we think of things like climate change. So how do we do that effectively without losing what we gain by doing, by, by keeping it in a small kind of uh, setting? So one of the things that I just wanted to alert people is that two weeks from now, when we return after the spring break, I'm going to be presenting one of the tools that we've been developing for a long time, building on the work that uh, in, in a collaboration that we did with Dan Mills and Leila uh, when Leila was a researcher, um, and that you know we're excited to to present. Uh, so how to use some of these platforms and, and and extend some of these ideas into into the future of what this could be. Uh, but with that, I would just want to wrap it up so that we have a few minutes at least of, of conversation. Here's our, um, you know, our contact information. I, I think that Hawaii has also posted in the chat. So feel free to contact us uh, with any questions that you might have following up this, this presentation. And with that, I think, uh, can I stop sharing and so that we can all see each other's faces? There we go. Thanks, Maura. I, I have... Um... Uh, a comment and uh, uh, two uh, quick questions. The comment is that uh, we are inviting uh, questions or comments, and uh, we'd appreciate it if uh, folks who are observing this conversation would post those uh, in the Q&A box, and we already have several uh, questions that have been posed. And then um, the question I would ask of, of all um, it is uh, derived in part from the first question that came to us. How do you go about uh, finding or developing the language uh, which makes sense to both um, community people who may not necessarily be versed in the tools and the platforms and the uh, other language that we use to describe this kind of work? Where is the language? 
uh, that, that brings people together. Um, and secondly, in, in a related way, um, could you give some more specific examples of um, how and where you have uh, use this process, and, and I'll give you a specific uh, kind of circumstance. Uh, let's say for the sake of discussion that I sit on a city planning board, and it's in a city that has uh, major problems with housing and gentrification. Um, voter participation has been low. Um, the, the same cast of characters show up at community meetings. And so we have a feeling that we're not really connecting with all of the people we need to connect with. I, I would like um, you as, as uh, scholars and researchers to give me a sense of how I as a policymaker would start to change that dynamic um, through participatory modeling in a way that uh, could then lead to uh, some more engaged solutions. Who wants to start? Who wants to start? I, I can jump in, but I would like to let other panelists speak first. If I could, um, sure. you asked first uh, about the language. Um, I can go back to 2014 when I first was invited into a conversation about participatory modeling. And because I do system process change work, stuff was clicking for me. But when I went to invite people to participate in this, that's not what I talked to them about. I talked to them about the protracted issues and problems that we're having and having a way of working that allows us to focus on gathering information in ways that helps inform our ability to make better decisions. We can't hold all this stuff you know, in our heads and we need, we need methods to do that. And so uh, that invitation brought 24 people to the first conference. So the language was, for me, it was all about making it every day. It was all about the practicality of what it is we're trying to do. And then we dumped them in the deep end and did causal loop diagrams and you know, fuzzy cognitive models and things of that nature. But I started the process by talking about what was important to us and, and using our language to then invite us into learning about some new ways to do this work. Renee, that's that's really really incredible, and and I couldn't couldn't uh, agree more. And I think one of it one of the things that we need to start thinking about, and and this comes more from the maybe the facilitation side is, uh, and also uh, you know I think about like Alan Alda's work uh, with like the Alan Alda Institute and how scientists need to become better communicators, and it's all about language. It's often cast as this it's all about simplifying things, and I think maybe there's a slight there needs to be a slight revision to that, um, and and I think. Uh, uh, a lot of the conversations, especially around uh, race, are, are, are where we're seeing uh, this topic come up more and more is that facilitators and folks in these spaces need to start adopting practices where they're, where they're getting better at code switching. And we can talk about it in terms of you know, cross-cultural competency, but there's also the, the, the we, we were talking about jargon in the, in the warm-up session a little bit, and that's also a factor as well. But it needs to be about how do we actually make these switches between how folks talk about problems. And I think it comes down to, and, and, and Renee and I were batting this around maybe a little bit last week, it comes down to how we train facilitators to operate in these spaces too, to help people find that common language. And I think part of it then is also, you, you start from the standpoint of difference, you start from the standpoint of different language, but over time as folks learn to work together, they start to develop language that works for them. And that gets to this practicality of, of being in the moment and acting together that really matters. And folks will develop all kinds of, of, of language-based innovations that work for their group um, and, and ways of making communication between each other more efficient. Uh, and so that's one of the things when we look at evaluation, that's one of the things we pay attention to is like, how do they switch from using really you know, long drawn out terms to things like, uh, oh, I'm gonna talk about this and then that. The switch from the actual term to using a pronoun is actually one of those indicators that communication is reaching higher levels of efficiency as folks develop uh, ways of communicating that has improved as they work together. So that's another way to, to talk about it as well. And yeah, cultural competence, like all of these things are tied together. Layla? Sorry, I was muted. 
Um, I just wanted to uh, remark as the computer, so I'm putting on my computer scientist hat for a second here, but um, language isn't just a spoken language. We also have a lot of other ways of communicating. Um, and you know, one of the things that I certainly tried to do in my work was try to put these ideas and these, these contact opportunities in places like museums or libraries where people can sit down and play with something and have fun. You know, so it's not that, you know, I, I love the photo you used, Dan, in your presentation of that, you know, really staid looking, um, you know, lecture hall, essentially. And that's what was happening, right? The people there were getting lectured to. And if we want to change the participatory model, we might want to think about changing the setting and changing the forms of action and engagement and the way, the kind of language it forms around that um, to let people feel like they can, they can play in the space. Yeah, Moira? And, and just to add that one of the things that, that I have decided to include, so I'm, I'm teaching a participatory modeling course, like a full semester course for the first time this, this term. Uh, and one of the things that I decided to add into this is something that I have actually used myself as I'm thinking that like the first real skill that we need to develop is listening. And, and, and mindfulness as well. And so I've actually incorporated, and also speaking to some of the things that uh, Dan was also saying in terms of just being in the moment, learning how to be in the moment, learning how to be in the discomfort of like, I'm not sure where this is going, but that's very much a part of the process that if we are trained to be able to do that, then we are much more effective at capturing things that are going on and understanding this language that is, you know, the community's language, but also that's co-evolving languages as, as we work together. And then tied to what Leila was saying about the playfulness, I'm also adding, you know, into the, 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 the class, improv techniques that allow us to like also be part of the moment, but like also play with what's happening and just have this exploratory uh, kind of attitude towards the whole uh, experience uh, of participatory modeling with, with this community. And so it really does help build that collaborative uh, uh, relationship uh, towards you know, these, these common goals, but like en engage more openly with this kind of like uh, uh, new language uh, and, uh, and playfulness, creativity. How do you go about uh, bringing uh, into these conversations more uh, of the people who uh, generally won't show up uh, for these uh, uh, kinds of uh, discussions and, and solution-oriented uh, processes? How, how do you get them to uh, engage with this? Uh, Dan, you had your hand up, so I'll, I'll let you go first. I had actually remembered that, that you did ask that follow-up, and so I wanted to come back to it. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of interesting work around this, especially around the issues uh, that you that you appointed to uh, housing and gentrification by, I think it's Catherine Einstein that um, maybe was at Boston or still is at Boston. Great book called Neighborhood Defenders, um, where they, they actually looked at community meetings and categorized the folks that showed up and came away with the conclusion that, you know, it is the usual suspects that always show up. Um, one of the ways is, is you know, and I and I and I I hope Renee would back me up on this is thinking about how we structure the processes, but also how we actually invite folks. So some colleagues of mine in the Midwest in the past have done things where where it's it's almost like I mean they call it a citizen jury, and it's almost like jury duty where where folks are randomly drawn out of a hat and sent a postcard and said, would you like to come participate uh, in in this process about this this problem? Uh, the the context in the case of my colleague in the Midwest was focused on climate change. And working in rural communities throughout Iowa and you know farm country, corn country, right, and bringing folks in that you would expect to not have a positive opinion of climate change at all, and asking them like we have to make decisions that are important for our community, and we want your voice. Uh, and so, so that kind of approach can work, it can improve uh, how how folks show up. But I think it's also linked to the the expected outcomes. Participation becomes. Uh, um, trying, tiring when you show up and show up and show up and you actually don't see any impact on the process, any impact on the outcome, that your contributions don't seem to matter when it comes to the final decision. And you get the comment of, well, they're just checking a box. The decision's always already been made. Why do I need to bother showing up? And then people will stop showing up. 
Uh, and so I think starting from the standpoint of like, we're going to have a process in which what you say will actually inform the outcome, will actually make a dent in the decision is one big way to make sure that folks, uh, ensure that folks have a better chance of showing up. Another way is to recognize that people showing up and the folks that we want to show up to these meetings have to donate their time. And maybe we can think of ways to pay them. Uh, yeah. If I have to give up time, if I have to give up money from my my wage, from my hourly wage job to show up to 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 solve this housing problem, that's money out of my pocket. That's food off my table. That's that medicine out of my kid's mouth. That's that's a problem. Uh, and also childcare, practical things that matter for people who work, practical things that matter for people who who have lives. All of those things are factored into this. Uh, and you know, it's no wonder that we see this this very weird age, age and gender distribution in the participation in these meetings because a lot of it has to do with the way that they're set up and the resources that are available. And I could go on and on and on, but I'll stop there. Do we have time for Layla's comment? Yes. I just want to say we'll pay for it. Ask for <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yes. It, be, before we wind down, I wish I, my heart and mind are singing tonight. This was a masterclass, not just in participatory modeling, but I think there are elements of what was said tonight that anybody in the academy who purports to be doing community engagement should be hearing what you are all talking about tonight, because values matter in this work. It is a human endeavor. It is not one just of, uh, it's not just an intellectual endeavor. And what you speak to is that the ethical is the strategic and the strategic is the ethical. That if we are not defining problems correctly from the beginning, we will continually be problem solving to the wrong uh, end because we have not defined what the problem and the end should be from the lived experience of community. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful. Um, I, I would like to end us with one last question. If that, is that okay, Ted, if I put one last question up there? I, I, when I teach systems thinking to undergrads, we always start by um, interrogating how challenging it is for us as humans. It is disruptive to become open to the idea, to the ambiguity of complex problems, to the lack of emotional gratification from checking off the box. But it's also disruptive to the academy. And I would just like us to have some, some last thoughts on this because we need a culture shift. And, and, and Leila, the work that you're doing in NSF around changing how funding happens, I think is important because sometimes we have to change processes before we can change culture. And you're really doing that by changing the funding, the funding mandate. But we're talking about showing up differently. We are talking about coming not as experts, but as learners, not as leaders, but as co-creators. We are talking about sharing credit. Um, we are talking about getting rid of this notion that there is an objectively right solution to these problems and that it's a messy process that involves an allowing solutions to emerge more organically or processes to emerge more organically. None of this aligns really with much of the way the hierarchical processes in higher ed are designed, nor in the ways people are celebrated in and, and rewarded in higher ed. I know that's, that could be the, the topic of an entire conversation, but again, we try to leave with a call to action. So, so what is the call to action in reimagining a cultural regeneration around the way we talk about community um, engagement in, in higher ed? And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave that out there and, and see who wants to dive in um, and, and give, a, give us a crack at that. Well, I'll dive in. <laughs> so I reflect back to when I first got started in this. And again, I came to a predisposed because I do systems process and change for a living. But the thing that was of deep value to me was I had to understand the academy. I needed to understand the hierarchy. And then on the flip side, I had to also say to my community folks, there are things that we need to effectively communicate to the folks in the academy about what our worlds look like. So that when we're looking at an opportunity, we're standing with a deep understanding of why things matter to each other. I understand more now why research is done the way it is, the tie to you know, tenure and student dissertations and, and the body of research and why that's necessary. So I understand what engagement looks like on that side, but also understanding as an ED, because I wear that hat too, of a nonprofit, what does that look like to me? 
and to the folks in my office and workers and people in the community. So I think we need to have that deep understanding of why and how each person participates, how they benefit, so we can look for those, those that sweet spot, I like to call it, of, of getting that kind of participatory engagement that's really going to get the outcomes that we're looking for. And, and I think it's safe to say that uh, uh, we're going to spend the rest of uh, this semester and almost certainly the uh, uh, summer and fall semester exploring exactly that question. Um, our universities do more than employ researchers and provide credentials for uh, our students. Uh, they are powerful uh, corporate entities uh, within our communities. Um, many have done extraordinarily well financially uh, during uh, this period of COVID that we've uh, just come through, while um, uh, many smaller ones um, have been absorbed or have failed. Um, the role of uh, learning institutions in our community, uh, the role is being reevaluated, and we're going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about um, how the communities that we as institutions serve um, can stop being subjects um, and really join uh, with uh, university personnel uh, to improve the quality of life in those communities. So uh, we'll be on this for uh, quite some time because it's an extraordinarily powerful and important subject for us to be discussing now. Yeah, and to be uh, Rebecca or too. Maura? Yeah, no, just to mention, like, also for, for community partners to be co-authors on, you know, the things that we publish. So how do we make that happen? Because it's a very different, you know, realm of, like, communication. And so how do we do that where they can become our co-authors when we publish, you know, these different things? So do we need to publish new things that have a different form? You know, I, that that's something that I that I'm, I have been questioning now, uh, you know, more recently, but like, how do we do that? Because I, it doesn't quite feel right to be publishing this work and then just in the acknowledgement, thank you to the stakeholders. You know, I just don't think that that's enough. No, it's not. Uh, we're back in two weeks. Rebecca, last words. Uh, thank you all. You know, I think that the relationships you have all formed amongst yourself as a community of practice and learning are modeling for us in real time what this is about. It is about relationships. It is about authenticity. It is about believing in uplifting each other and, and building each other's capacity, not just being out for, for ourselves in any way. And so I want to thank you for, for modeling all of that for us. And uh, I will look forward to seeing many of you in Detroit. I'm so excited. Excited. Uh, thank you for sharing all of this with us tonight. Thank you so much for having us. It was a wonderful conversation, and we look forward to ongoing conversations. Terrific. Good night, everybody. Take care. Good night. Take care. Good night. Take care.